This is the first of four lectures on Buddhism. The academic study of Buddhism began fairly recently. It was only in the 1800s that Western scholars connected all the dots and realized that these disparate East Asian religions were really so many branches of a single religious tradition going back to India. In fact, some scholars resist even characterizing this as one single religious tradition. Some scholars count three religions, which you can call Southern Buddhism, Northern Buddhism, and Eastern Buddhism, and they consider them not as three parts of one whole Buddhism, but really as distinct religions with distinct institutions, distinct canons, distinct views about ultimate reality, and distinct diagnoses and cures. The Western world's understanding of Buddhism got off to a rocky start. It was arguably badly distorted by Edwin Arnold's hit book called The Light of Asia, first published in 1879. This book portrays Buddhism as the most rational and non-supernatural religion, and it cuts out core Buddhist doctrines, as well as Buddhist mythology and anything that might seem like magic or superstition. It pretty much presents religion as an Enlightenment thinker would like it to be. This book went through 60 editions in England and 80 editions in America and has sold perhaps a million or more copies. It is a well-written piece of literature, and the illustrations are pretty neat. But if you really want to understand Buddhism as a historical phenomenon, you need to try to understand Buddhism as most Buddhists have understood it, and not how we want it to be. The man who we believed founded this religious tradition is called Siddhartha Gautama Shakyamuni. This breaks down to a first name, a last name, and Shakyamuni means a great sage, a great wise man, from the Shakya clan. And very often Buddhists will refer to him as Shakyamuni Buddha. Why bother with the Shakyamuni? Well, because in Buddhism there are many other Buddhas, so they refer to him as Shakyamuni Buddha to distinguish him from the other enlightened beings. So this is a later title, rather than a name properly speaking, and historians point out that even the name Siddhartha is historically doubtful. His traditional dates are something like 563 to 483, before the Common Era. And those dates are anything but clear. Some scholars have argued that he died closer to the year 400 than to the year 500, and death dates as late as 350 BCE have been argued for. Then again, you'll find that some sources push him back farther. There's a feeling that people have in religious matters that the older the better. So there's kind of a motive to push back founders to an earlier period. Let's talk then about the life of the Buddha, that is, the traditional life of the Buddha. As a matter of history, all of this is very uncertain. What just about any textbook presentation I've seen does is comes up with its own composite of the great many versions of this life story. They tend to focus, though, on one from Ashvagosa, who lived in the first century Common Era, and I'm going to focus on his version as well. Many of the colorful details differ in the different versions of this story. And some scholars will even argue that some elements of it, such as his being born a prince to a powerful king, is most likely false. You also have to wonder about other elements, like his not knowing about disease or death until young adulthood. In any case, keep in mind that the Buddha died in either the 5th or the 4th century BCE, and a lot of elements of this story derive from Ashvagosa, who lives in the 1st century Common Era. So you've got a time gap there, right? The Buddha, we believe, died sometime around, the tradition says, around here. If you want to be vaguer, we could say the Buddha died sometime around here. And then, what, if he died in 350, then 100, 200, 300, 300 something, going on 400 years. This is when Ashvagosa was active. And then some of the details, of course, come from later times. Now, having sounded that skeptical note very clearly, we have to keep in mind that these stories are in the genre of hagiography, 
hagiography means a biography of a saint. And in fact, not so much a biography as edifying stories, an edifying life story, some holy person or saint. A piece of hagiography is composed as much to edify, to serve some spiritual purpose, as it is to accurately inform. And also, this story is just not foundational to Buddhism in the same way that the story of Jesus is foundational to Christianity. What's primary to Buddhism, most Buddhists will tell you, is the Dharma, that is, the distinctive message, the teachings of Buddhism. Dharma, by the way, can mean many things. But one of the main meanings is the teachings of Buddhism. So, for instance, Buddhist groups will have a Dharma talk, basically a Buddhist sermon. And these facts may be, in part, why so many versions of these stories have proliferated. Still, pretty much any kind of Buddhism has, as central to it, this type of common narrative. So let's get to it. Gautama was allegedly born as royalty. He was the son of a king and queen in a small kingdom, in what is now Nepal, but really, historically, it's part of greater India. It's within that area. It's said that his mother had a vision of a white elephant entering her womb. Sages predict that her child will be either a king or a sage. In most versions of the story, he's not born vaginally. He doesn't come out the normal way. Presumably, the author thought that that would defile him, that would be unfitting for such a great being. And there's a later story from the Middle Ages, and probably developed in response to Christianity, that his was a virgin birth. But in Ashvagosa and earlier versions, it's not a virgin birth, although it is an unusual birth in many ways. And in most versions, this little baby jumps up and immediately is able to walk and talk. He announces his purpose to save the world. There's an earthquake and water pours from the sky. Priests predict a great future for him based on the auspicious marks on the baby's body. Everything from the way his teeth are lined up to marks on the bottom of his feet to the shape of his chest and so on. And shortly after his birth, his mother dies. In some versions of happiness. In his youth, it's said that in only a few days, he learned the sciences, branches of human knowledge which it normally takes many years to learn. For his part, his father, the king, is afraid that the boy will become a renouncer, that he will dedicate his life to a religious purpose. And so the king tries to immerse him and to entangle him in a world of sensual pleasures. The king gives him many concubines. And also, he gets married to his cousin at the age of 16 or 19, depending on the version, a young lady named Yasodhara. And she soon gives birth to a son who is named Rahula, which some say means fetter. In other words, the kind of fetter that would hold your leg in place if you were a prisoner. It's, it's kind of like naming your child ball and chain. An important part of the story are the four sights. These are four things the Buddha sees when he's a young married man that instigate a religious crisis for him. He's growing restless in the palace, and so his father, the king, decides to send him out for a pleasant ride in his chariot. But before he does that, the king clears the streets of any kind of afflicted people. But it turns out that the deities of the pure abode thwart the king. And they see to it that in the chariot's path there occur the following four things. First, there's an old man. Second, a sick man. Third, a corpse. And finally, a monk, that is, a renouncer. And in the story, the Buddha has no idea what they are, and other people have to explain to him the first three sights shock him into realization that this is truly a realm of suffering. It's quite depressing that we grow old, that we get sick, that we die, and someday we'll be cremated. The fourth sight sets him on to the idea that there could be a better way, that maybe he can find some way beyond it. These religious guys have renounced ordinary life and laid aside ordinary pleasures in order to seek release, to seek release from samsara, release from the reincarnation cycle, and thus release from this terrible realm of suffering. 
where you have age, sickness, and death. In the next segment, we'll see how he pursues this course. <laughs> 